So what came first, the dentist or the comic? <clears throat> the dental thing was a nasty rumor. And you know when it started? <laughs> okay, what the when? When you graduated from the day I graduated school? from dental school. That's right. <laughs> that's when it started, and it never let up. The whole to all these years, and there's still that rumor persists. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And you know who started it? My patients. <laughs> It was just unbelievable how that, it just gets out of hand. But they've accused a lot of people of being dentists. You know, some of the biggest guys in show business, they accused of being dentists. Michael Eisner, you know, people, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Zucker, they all, they're all they all dentists. I think it has something to do with being Jewish. Oh, yeah. Jewish and dentists, they just, right away, they lump us all together. I, I read that you said uh, ever since you were 12, you wanted to be both a dentist and a comic. Yeah, it was a weird thing, you know? Like, I remember, it's funny, I remember so clearly being 12 years old and trying to decide what I wanted to do in my life. And I, I had the feeling I wanted to be a doctor of some kind, but I was too sensitive to do anything with, like, life and death. So then I thought I wanted to be an orthodontist because I was going to an orthodontist, and I liked the idea of making people look good. Right. And I was already writing comedy. And I thought to myself, I want to do both, but who ever heard of, like, a dentist in show business? How am I going to do that? You know what I mean? And I literally remember having those thoughts, and it was so confusing to me. Like, how am I going to pull that off, you know? And and it's so weird that that became my life, you know, that I, I – I didn't become an orthodontist. I was a specialist in cosmetic dentistry. Oh. But the whole time I was writing comedy for, like, Rodney Dangerfield and Joan Rivers and people like that while I was still in practice. Mm -hmm. So how did it, you make that connection or that tra transition? How did I make it? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had no choice, really. It was like I was doing both at the same time. And I realized that if you're going to be in, a, in another field – and you're going to write comedy, you better write for very famous people, or else it sounds like a joke. Like, I don't know if you guys knew the Ed Sullivan show, yeah. mm -hmm. but it was a very popular show in the States. And he would have on, like, very strange acts, like plate spinners and a knife-throwing act. And I'm like, I didn't want to sound like a knife-throwing act, you know what I mean? Like, you know, he does fillings, he writes jokes, he has a tap dancing school. I, <laughs> I didn't want to do any of that. I figured, so if people were going to take me seriously, then I'd better write for, like, very famous people. Right. Wow. Right. So I just geared myself to writing for, like, big stars. And the first big one was Rodney Dangerfield. And, you know, and he was doing my stuff on The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. But then they would call me at the office, and my nurse had very strict instructions. Only disturb me for show business. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> if I'm with a patient, don't dare disturb me unless it's something in show business. So they would come in and they'd say, excuse me, uh, Dr. Rivers is on the phone or <laughs> Dr. Burl is calling or, you know, Dr. Belzer is on the phone. The only one that no one believed was Dr. Dangerfield. Oh, really? that, you know, no one ever fell for that one, you know, Dr. Dangerfield. But – that's what I would do. I would, I would, you know, I would be drilling, and then I would get a call, like, we need a, a speech. We need some jokes for this or that. You know, I was writing for the Friars Club at the time. Yeah. And I remember the first time I got a call, it was for the Jim Dale roast back in the 80s. And I was like, they needed me to do it that night. I was like, <laughs> drilling and writing jokes. I would be drilling, and then I'd run to my desk and write down some jokes, and then run back to the chair and then write some more jokes. And it was crazy. And then I had to go to Jim Dale's house and meet with him. Right. And it was it was just it was a very exciting thing. And I was a kid. I didn't you know, I didn't care that I was doing all that you know all that work. It was just it was just fun for me. It was it's always been fun. It's amazing that you're able to to do that. So did, when you started, were you submitting your jokes to the, the agents of these comics? or No, you know what I was doing? I was actually going to the clubs. I was meeting people. I got started oh, wow. from the original Saturday Night Live people. Yep. Um, the show was only about a year or two old. And I, um, I had been making little films myself on the street, like using a Super 8 camera. And I was filming things like um, 
bizarre news. You know, years later, I had my own column in Weekly World News called Gurian's World of the Bizarre. Uh-huh. And I always liked strange stories, you know, like tap dancing for the criminally insane. <laughs> and uh, Canadian repairman wakes up with French accent. That's, a, that's one that I'll tell you guys later because your Canadian audience will appreciate that. <laughs> but um, I was doing stories like, <clears throat> like several men were arrested for smearing cream cheese on the ankles of elderly women who wore their stockings rolled down like bagels. Oh, my God. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it, if the old women in Canada do that, but in this country, old women would take their stockings and roll them down their legs and so they'd be around their ankles, <laughs> and it would look like bagels. It was fucking yeah. horrible. It would, I, I would get nauseous. And, and so I went to my dear grandmother, and I begged her to let me put cream cheese on her ankles so I could make this film. And she said, Jeffrey, only for you would I do this. Uh-huh. And she made believe she had a Jewish accent and that she had just come to this country. And she said, you know, Jewish people, we have two kinds of stockings, one for milk and one for meat. <laughs> she goes, and this crazy man, he smeared, he smeared cream cheese on my meat stockings, and I can't get it off. So I do these films, and I bring them up to Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And how I got up there was ridiculous. In those days... There was no security because this was before terrorism. There was no bombs going off in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You could pull, you could pull right up to 30 Rock because that's where Saturday Night Live comes from. 30 right. Rockefeller Plaza. All right. right. It's on 49th Street and Fifth Avenue for any of you Toronto guys who have been to New York, and it's right in the heart of everything. Mm-hmm. And these days you can't pull anywhere near the building, but in those days you could pull up right in front. Now, I was driving a pimp mobile in those days, which was a car that, had, that only pimps drove. It was a car that had been made for one of the Isley brothers. <laughs> okay. And I, ha- I actually got confirmation on that last year, and I'll tell you that story, too. It was, it was a Mandarin Orange Eldorado. Oh, my. Eldorado. I saw one the other day, actually. An Eldorado, a 1975 Mandarin Orange Eldorado. It was a boat, basically. Yeah. And I bought the car, and I put a Rolls-Royce grill on it like the pimps did. And it had big white wall tires and a cabriolet roof. <laughs> and it had these straps in the back, just like the pimp strobe, but mine had doctor's plates on it. <laughs> so it was very confusing to people. Yeah, sure. And so, and I, and I had a CB radio. There were no car phones in those days, but I had a CB radio that was in the shape of a phone. So I pull up to 30 Rock, and I throw the doorman a few dollars, and I said to the guy, uh, watch my car, Lorne Michaels is expecting me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had a lot of balls in those days. <laughs> and so he had no reason to doubt me because no one ever saw a white man in a car like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> All my black friends, they would give me thumbs up on the car. And my wife was like, we're Jewish and we live in Scarsdale. Why am I driving an orange Cadillac? <laughs> and I'm like, you don't get it. Obviously, you don't get it, you know? And I was playing Superfly tapes, eight-track tapes in those days. I thought that was my aspiration. I wanted to be super fly. So I pull up to the building, and I throw the guy some money, and I go inside. He's watching my car for me, and I sneak past security because in those days you could do that. You know, these days they'll shoot at you, but in those days you could just do it. So I snuck into the elevator, and I got up to Saturday Night Live, and everybody was kids. It was a new show. Alan Zweig Bell was there, who has gone on to become an award-winning producer, director, writer, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he was playing handball on the wall with uh, a guy named Neil Levy, who was one of the producers of the show, who I believe was related to Lorne Michaels. And so I introduce myself, and I, I tell him about my films, and he agrees to look at them. And I kept sneaking into the show, man. I was sending flowers to the receptionist. I kept, just kept getting up there, and they watched my stuff, and Alan liked it enough that he called his manager for me. And his manager was a guy named David Jonas, who was most famous for discovering Freddie Prinze. Not the Freddie Prinze that you know, Freddie Prinze Sr., right. the one, the original, who was on uh, Chico and the Man. Well, and, no, I didn't think it was the... 
The junior. <laughs> yeah, no, the junior, right. Yeah, it was yeah. it was the real guy, the real deal, Freddie Prinz. And, and so he got him Chico and the Man. And so he's the guy that got me started through Alan. He was handling Alan at the time. And this guy was working with comedians. And so it took me about a year to learn how to write a joke. 